Hi, this is Bernie Hansen at North Carolina State University. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate placement of a nasal oxygen catheter. Supplies needed include two op monofilament suture with materials to place it with, including a 22 gauge needle, 0.1 to 0.5 mils of injectable lidocaine, 2% lidocaine lubricant, 1 inch waterproof white tape, and an appropriate catheter, in this case, an 8 French red rubber tube. Here's a sad looking dog in need of nasal oxygen. Before I get my materials together, I'll apply the lidocaine. I've drawn up half a mil for this dog, which proves to be too much because you'll see him swallow when the video resumes. You want to inject up to 2.5 mils, but no more than necessary to numb the nasal cavity. If they gag or swallow or cough, you can stop injecting. There's the swallow. Next, I'll pack in a little bit of 2% lidocaine lubricant. This will help further numb the orifice of the nostril, and this viscous solution will gradually kind of melt back into the nasal cavity, providing lubrication and uh, extra lidocaine for topical anesthesia. Now I'll determine the depth of placement of the catheter, and the anatomical landmark is the vertical ramus of the mandible. This will put the tip of the catheter over the soft palate in the nasopharynx. I'll mark that location on the tube by keeping my fingers at the depth of the orifice of the nostril and putting a little pledge of waterproof white tape in a butterfly wing pattern around the catheter and that's going to serve as both a depth gauge and material to suture to to secure it. After two or three minutes I'll lubricate the catheter with the 2% lidocaine lubricant and prepare to place this. This is the key part of this whole procedure because the tip of the catheter has to go underneath the middle turbinate and to achieve that I'm going to have to push the nose up with my left thumb and push down on the soft tissue of the nasal plane and with my left index finger to direct this catheter ventral aiming it to the first incisor on the ipsilateral side. Once the catheter is inserted into a, the nostril by about a centimeter then I can start with the mushing and pushing of the nose. In this video, I actually don't advance the catheter into the nose until I've already pushed the nose up, but in practice, I typically will put that in first and then lift the nose up. That little oops showed up there because despite this amount of effort, I screw up and the catheter does ride over the middle turbinate and advances to the level of the ethmoid where it's going to hang up. So I advance it with no resistance at this level, but once it's reaching the ethmoid, I, I experience some firm resistance, and so I'm going to bail on this attempt and remove it and try again. When I pull it out and hold it up next to the dog's head, you can see that it does advance to about the medial canthus of the eye, and that's roughly the level of the ethmoid turbinate. So in the next attempt, I'm going to advance it just inside the nostril and then be even more aggressive with the mushing and pushing uh, to see if I can't get this thing to go below the middle turbinate. In this uh, sagittal section of a cadaver dog, here you can see the arrow pointing to the middle turbinate and the catheter has positioned over that and stops up against the ethmoid turbinate as indicated by this arrow here. So we'll be a little more aggressive on this attempt and once it's cleared the rostral end of the nasal bone I can stop with the mushing and pushing and this time it advances all the way to my marking tape and I know I'm in the correct location. So I'm going to wrap that tightly around the wing of the uh, ala and plan on suturing it in location. This sagittal section shows the tip of the catheter residing in the nasopharynx which is pretty collapsed in this uh, formal and preserved cadaver. So now I'm going to place this 22 gauge needle through the leading edge of the tape at the junction of haired and hairless skin at the nasal planum. You don't want to go through the hairless part because that's pretty sensitive, but be as close to that as possible. I'll drive the needle through the tape, then grab some skin, and then out the other wing of tape on the other side, and confirm that I've grabbed some skin by lifting up on the needle to demonstrate that it is indeed through some skin.
I find that the 22 gauge needle is tolerated by dogs much better than a uh, swedged on needle, so I prefer to use this. Then the suture has to be passed through the bevel end of the needle. You can't pass it through the lure end of the, of the needle. That end doesn't act like a funnel, it acts like you're trying to hit a target at the bottom of a deep well. So the suture fits snugly, but it does fit through a 22 gauge needle. We'll pass it through and then tie this snugly but not tight. You never want to make this so tight that it's going to do any damage to the skin. And cut that short. If the uh, width of the tape is too wide for the dog's face, you can also trim off the uh, ends of this piece of tape uh, to get it out of its field of view. The next piece of tape is going to go over the frontal sinus. Um, at the junction between the bridge of the nose and the beginning of the frontal sinus, this tape's a little bit too far back, but I think it'll be acceptable. When we're done, we're going to want the catheter to be not here, but right in the middle of the dog's face. So I'm going to create an exaggerated S-curve like this positioning the tape a little bit towards the right of the midline on the dog so that after I've got this anchored to the skin and release it, the tension from the catheter will pull it back straight so the catheter is running right down the middle of the dog's head. So I'll create this over-corrected S-curve in suture in that location, so hopefully it'll end up kind of like this. So the suturing technique is the same as for the first one. I'll place a needle through the uh, tape, grab some skin, and out the tape on the other side. Now, despite my effort, this isn't great in that it wound up pulling uh, somewhat into the field of vision for the left eye, but I think it'll be acceptable, so I'm going to leave this. If it was any worse than this, I would probably repeat it and do even more aggressive overcorrection on that S curve to make sure it wound up not in the dog's direct field of vision. Next, we have to anchor this thing uh, to some uh, bandaging material around the dog's neck. You never want the uh, poor little suture over the frontal sinus to be responsible for holding on to a supply uh, to bring in the oxygen to the catheter. So if the dog does not already have a collar or a central venous catheter in a jugular vein, we'll make a soft padded collar out of cast padding elastic gauze and uh, vet wrap or some similar material and tape the tubing to that to relieve any tension from the suture on the frontal sinus. So we should put just enough cast padding and other material here to create a bulky bandage that'll uh, be comfortable for the dog and serves as a good anchor for the tubing. Notice that the dog's nose should be pointing down more than this while I'm placing it. That way when the dog's uh, not being restrained and wants to be in a natural position laying down, this bandage won't bind and be too tight. So if I were to do this again, I'd be more aggressive about pushing the dog's nose down like that. We use these plastic connectors that adapt the flare on a feeding tube like this to a medical grade oxygen line and then that oxygen line gets taped to the dog's bandage. When it's taped the dog's face should be tipped down again uh, to mimic normal motion and ensure that when the dog does go to eat or drink or lick its front feet it doesn't put too much tension on that suture over the frontal sinus. So that piece of white tape is going to do all the holding of the uh, catheter or of the tube to the dog. This is a um, humidification chamber. You can buy these in boxes of six from several different companies. Uh, Baxter and Abbott sell these, I believe. And they're, they're made for use once and destroy, but they'll last a very long time. Note at the top of the uh, base of the container, the white part, in the middle there's a little protrusion there, and that's a pop-off valve where in the system overpressures, it should chirp or buzz or make some other type of audible alarm noise. I'll now turn on the flow. And typically the dose of oxygen is 50 mils per kg per minute to a maximum of three to four 
liters per minute. As a final check for security of the system, I'm going to pinch the tube on the dog's nose. That should overpressure the system and cause that pop-off valve to chirp or buzz or do its thing to alert you that the system is tight and that occluding it here causes it to blow the pop-off. If you don't immediately, or at least within a second or two, hear the pop-off valve blow, there's a leak somewhere in the system you need to attend to.